Welcome to Sustainable Connections. Today we are in Clayton, North Carolina with Dr. Clyde Sorensen, an entomologist at NC State University, and we are actually sitting on his dock, which is absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much, Dr. Sorensen, for having us here today. I'm glad to be glad to be with you. So, an entomologist, like every kid's dream, playing with insects, right? So tell me how you got into this position. So, I, uh, I've always been fascinated by all kinds of living things, and you know, like a lot of a lot of folks when I was a kid, I, I collected insects, I uh, would catch butter, butterflies and bees and, you know, look at them and then let them go, And but I've always been interested in all kinds of living things, and uh, when I uh, went to college, I already had the intention at some point or another to end up being a professor because I like learning about things and I like talking to people about things and teaching folks. And so um, I started out as a wildlife student and I got my bachelor's in wildlife biology at NC State. And then I uh, did several really kind of fun jobs. I worked with alligators and red cockaded woodpeckers and a little bit with bobcats and, and things like that. And um, in the process of doing that, I ended up um, working with some uh, of the entomologists at NC State. And I came to the realization that uh, insects are just wildlife just like any other kinds of animals. Um, they're little, they don't have backbones, but in many ways they're probably the most important wildlife in most ecosystems because they do so many critical things in the ecology of different kinds of, of systems. So. They're important as pollinators, as um, predators, real important as prey for lots of other animals. And um, so I came to the realization that maybe I could be a really great wildlifer by studying insects. And so then I got my master's and my PhD at NC State, both in entomology. And from there I wandered around doing a couple different jobs. Um, I worked for the University of Nevada in Reno for a short while. And then I worked uh, for the University of Missouri in Columbia before I came back to NC State and joined the faculty of uh, the department I'm in now. What's your fun funniest story about your insects? <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's one I, I kind of hate to tell on myself, but um, like most entomologists, I'm pretty fascinated by most insects, but there are some insects that just kind of creep me out. And um, the ones that creep me out, or some of them that creep me out, are some of the the, uh, the pest species of cockroaches that aren't mm. native. And so um, many years ago when I was a graduate student, um, I was taking a class in insect physiology, which is we're trying to understand um, how insects work, how their digestive systems work, how their nervous systems work, how their reproductive tracts work. And uh, at that time, I was doing my research on my master's, which involved doing what's called a bioassay, where I would go into my greenhouse, and we had a whole bunch of tomato plants. I was studying what, uh, a, a topic called host plant resistance in tomatoes, so breeding tomato plants to protect themselves against um, pests. And so I would take a, a little plastic dish, and I would cut a little circle of leaf tissue out, and I would put it in that dish and then put two insects on that leaf disc and then come back 24 hours later and see how much was eaten and how much wasn't. And uh, so I was doing these bioassays and I was taking this class in insect physiology. And one afternoon, we spent the whole afternoon studying the reproductive um, systems of insects. And the model that we use is the American cockroach, which is a big cockroach. <laughs> You may have seen them, folks. Some folks call them water bugs because they can't admit they got cockroaches. But anyway, <laughs> um, we were studying them because they're really big and they're very basic, and you can see things on them. And we spent the whole afternoon dissecting American cockroaches, males and females. And then after we got done with the lab, by the time we got done with the lab, it was dusk, and it took me about 45 minutes to get set up to go do an ass a bioassay, go into the greenhouse and harvest the material. And so by the time I got to the greenhouse, it was dark. And so I was carrying my little K2 
cafeteria tray with maybe 50 or so little plastic petri dishes um, so I could go in and cut my little leaf disc out and I opened the greenhouse door and this was an old kind of ragged greenhouse made out of wood that um, actually has been torn down now and I, I opened the door and I used my elbow to flick the light on and I walked in two steps and from all over the greenhouse cockroaches started coming at me uh -oh. and one actually flew at me and hit my chest and ran up my shirt and then down my collar and another one ran up my leg and so I did what anybody would do I screamed like a little child <laughs> through the dishes in the air and backed out the door taking my shirt off with one hand and my pants off with the other to get the cockroaches off I mean I I just left my mess there and so the question is why did the cockroaches attack me and the answer is I had been working with female cockroaches, virgin female cockroaches um, in the afternoon and I had apparently had pheromone on my hands and maybe on my clothing and so to all those little male cockroaches in that greenhouse I just smelled like a big old girl. And so that's that's a yeah an event I, I try to forget but can't forget. It's it's funny now mm -hmm. but Pretty Not horrifying when it happened. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we know that the United Nations has 17 goals that they want us to try to solve before the year 2030. And one of those is goal 15, life on land. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people are scared of bugs and insects, right? They're, they're creepy crawlers and they want to, there's a bug, kill it. Why should we not do that? Well, I think for one thing, the, most folks should, should understand that uh, 99.9 percent .9 of insect species uh, in the world and there are more species of insects than any other animals we know of there's over a million species of insects we've identified and perhaps millions more yet to identify the vast majority of those animals are completely harmless to us they really have no way they can harm us and I think a lot of people um, uh, are kind of fearful of insects because they're small and they move uh, rapidly or in unpredictable ways and there are some that we have some deservedly negative associations with um, but without without a doubt the vast majority of insects that folks encounter in their day-to-day -day lives are actually beneficial even if we're not deriving any kind of a tangible product from them or a clearly identifiable service from them they're still part of the ecosystem that supports us and you, you may have heard this metaphor before it's not uh, original to me lots of folks have used it but but you know life is a web this is like a spider web if you tug on this web over here the whole web shifts a little bit mm -hmm. and so Every one of those species of insects, the ones that don't cause us direct harm or some other kind of, of uh, have some other kind of pest status, um, they're all helping to keep that web intact so that um, the ecosystem we rely on remains robust and healthy. So unless that insect is like, you know, threatening your livelihood, <laughs> um, there's probably not any good reason to kill most of them. Uh, even the ones you find in your house, the vast majority of the insects you find in your house, you know, they, they actually don't probably want to be there. They probably accidentally got in there. And, and, you know, if you could show them the door, they'd probably appreciate it. Well, we're in North Carolina right now. Do we have any invasive insects that are threatening the environment here? So we actually have a, quite a few invasive insects. And so what's an invasive insect an invasive species is a species generally that's not native to a particular area that gets introduced to that particular area and because of its reproductive potential and the fact that it's been released from all the things that regulated its population where it was from um, has uh, the ability to, to um, reproduce rapidly and have outsize ecological impact and we have a lot of 
those in North America, and we have a number of them in North Carolina. Uh, one uh, that I've done some uh, a little bit of of uh, work with, and I teach my students about, um, is the balsam woolly adelgid, which is a little tiny aphid-like thing that attacks Fraser firs in the mountains. Another one um, that's had tremendous ecological impact over the last couple decades is the hemlock uh, woolly adelgid, which is another little aphid-like thing, but it's basically wiped hemlocks out in the mountains, southern Appalachian mountains in North Carolina. There are still hemlocks up there, but very few, and they've, they've, they've really suffered. And because the hemlock is a keystone species in the ecosystems it inhabits in terms of modifying the environment, cooling streams and things like that, um, that impacts had a lot of, of consequences. A more recent one that um, is invading North Carolina right now, but has had devastating effects uh, in, the mid, in the Midwest, is the emerald ash borer, which is a beautiful little green shiny beetle about this long, which is essentially eliminating ash from uh, hardwood forests in many parts of North America and is now um, becoming widespread in North Carolina. In North Carolina, ash is not as significant a component of the forest systems as it is in, say, Illinois and um, Ohio and, and places like that, but it's still a very important species and it's a commercially important group of species of trees and unless we figure something out, they ashes may basically disappear as a, as ecological function, uh, functioning member of the, of the ecosystem within a few years. So these invasive species take the resources away from the native species that are already there. So, yeah, so invasive species compete with native species. Sometimes, as we see with these uh, insects, they actually um, uh, suppress the populations of plant species that are very important to lots of other native insects and birds and mammals. And so uh, invasive species are um, very, very problematic. Another one is uh, that's a kind of particular concern to me in the eastern part of the state and that is, uh, has entered North Carolina, has probably become much more widespread, is a little tiny beetle that attacks red bay trees. And the beetle itself is a problem, but the fungus that the beetle carries kills the, the red bay. And so red bay may disappear as a, a component of uh, the forests in, in eastern um, North Carolina, as it has largely disappeared in um, Georgia and Florida and parts of South Carolina within the next several years. And of course, there are lots of species that depend on red bay. For instance, the Palamedes swallowtail, which is one of our more spectacular butterflies in North Carolina, the only host it feeds on is red bay. And so if red bay goes away, so does the pal palamidae swallowtail. So that swallowtail. circle of life is just yeah. a piece of that, of that web mm -hmm. is moved. So if you pull the red bay, you tug on that piece of the web and pull the red bay out, then that piece of the web is broken now. Mm -hmm. And the things that are connected to it are, um, the strands that are connected to it are, are uh, endangered. Well, I was looking online the other day uh, at a pet store and you were able to buy things like tarantulas and all these different types. So could that be a problem if you buy it and then decide you don't want it anymore and release an uh, exotic species like that? It depends on the species and frankly the vast majority of the species that are sold as um, pets probably at least in most of North Carolina, probably couldn't persist because they're not really adapted to a cold winter. But we've seen the hazards of selling exotic animals as pets um, in other parts of the country, for instance in Florida where um, escaped and released pets have become 
huge issues mm -hmm. all across uh, that state. And that's not unique to Florida, it's just really bad in Florida. And you were talking about invasive species of, of snakes like the Burmese python and um, invasive lizards like the tegu. Mm -hmm. And uh, those are animals that, that those ecosystems didn't evolve with and consequently they're having huge impacts on the ecosystem. Um, so as far as arthropods go, again, and most of those that are sold as pets in North Carolina um, probably can't establish um, because they probably can't tolerate the winter. But uh, you know, that's a blanket statement that has exceptions almost certainly. And um, you would hope, and that th there are regulations on what species can be sold as pets. Um, but then there's always the possibility for some people who are perhaps less scrupulous to sell um, things that shouldn't be sold. Right. But in general, I, I, uh, even though it's really cool to have a lot of these things, and some of them are fascinating to observe, um, you have to be very conscientious about taking on um, exotic animals as pets, including exotic arthropods. One of my favorite memories, Dr. Sorensen, as a child was collecting lightning bugs or fireflies. I know that that's also something that you enjoy, but on a deeper level, like you're trying to locate them. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing right now with these fireflies or lightning bugs. So. Um a few years ago, I, I uh, started paying attention in my own yard um, to the diversity of fireflies. Now, I'll, I'll, be a, I'll admit, when I was a kid, I called them lightning bugs. And all my friends around here in Johnston County get all over me for calling them fireflies. But um, I've come to call them fireflies, but I think because it's just a little bit more uh, of a poetic uh, uh, description of them. Um, so this is actually an outgrowth of another thing that I was doing, which was trying to get a grip on the diversity of moths in my yard. Okay. And so I started several years ago taking pictures of all the moths that came to my porch light and then identifying those moths from the, the pictures. And while I was doing that, I started noticing, well, fireflies were showing up on my porch light too, so I started taking their pictures as well. And. Um, with the moths, I'm still doing that. You might want to take a guess at how many species of moths I've identified in my yard so far in the last five years. 20? Uh, 20. It's a little higher. Okay. It's 565 so far. And just in your backyard? In my yard. And if I add the butterflies and the moths that haven't been at my porch light that I've found, I'm way over 600 species of Lepidoptera. Now, is that specific to you because you're an entomologist and they just come to see you? No, no. <laughs> I, I think anybody who wants to pay attention, um, and there are some really neat tools on the internet that you can use to help you identify them. I think anybody that wanted to could probably find that they have s several hundred species of moths and butterflies using their backyard, inter at least intermittently. So as a consequence of that though, which is a fun story we could talk about later, um, I started seeing the fireflies and then I started watching the fireflies in my yard and noticing, um, in addition to looking at pictures and realizing I had different species of fireflies that were coming to my porch light that I was seeing lots of different flash patterns, I got really interested in the fireflies as well. And um, so, I started trying to understand the diversity of fireflies in my yard and consequently um, got involved uh, with some folks in the Natural Heritage Program here to try and help uh, set up a system to understand the diversity of fireflies in the state and their distribution. And we have somewhere in North Carolina, somewhere between 30 and 40 species of fireflies. Um, fireflies, by the way, are not flies and they're not bugs. Beetles? They're beetles. And of course beetles, um, the order Coleoptera, which is what beetles are, um, is the most diverse group of animals on the face of the planet. There are 300 and 
50,000 or some species of beetles in the world. And so trying to understand the diversity of all of them is kind of overwhelming, but maybe we can get a good grip on the diversity of 30 to 40 species of fireflies across North Carolina. It's a manageable project. And so um, we, we've set up a system to try and um, help us describe that distribution of the different species. And this summer, one of my main missions is to populate that, that web resource with information so that folks can start helping us understand that distribution by taking pictures and watching for fireflies and things like that. Um, so fireflies are kind of fun to work with because um, they have that really cool communication system that's very apparent to visually um, oriented animals like us. And so we can learn a lot uh, by just watching flash patterns and taking pictures. Well, one of the things that really in inspires people is the, the idea of the synchronous fireflies that you can see at certain times of the year where they're very active. Um, why is it just certain times or, or is it? So uh, the synchronous firefly phenomenon is it's a pretty spectacular thing. I, I think it's something that everybody ought to have a chance to see even though right now there aren't enough opportunities for everybody to have that chance. I think it's something that everybody um, should try and witness at some point or another. So with the synchronous fireflies, um, what we're seeing is under really high population levels, the male fireflies who do most of the risky business of flying around looking for females, um, synchronize their flash patterns. And um, it's not exactly clear to us why they do that, but it only happens when their populations achieve a certain kind of density. In North America, in Eastern North America, we have um, so far that we know two species that synchronize. Um, one that's found in the Appalachian Mountains, from probably from at least Northern Georgia all the way up into um, at least Pennsylvania and another species that occurs in the lowlands of the coastal plain of the southeastern United States um, that uh, typically lives in more um, kind of wetland habitats. And so both of these species, the one in the mountains, I'm gonna throw some scientific names at you, but they're really cool scientific names. At least one of them I think is really cool because it is actually honoring my home state here. Um, the one that occurs in the mountains is called Photinus carolinus. So it's the Carolina firefly. And um, this is the one that we've known about as a synchronous species for a lot longer. It's really, really famous because of the big aggregations that happen in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park um, at Elkmont. Um, there are several other places that I know of where this species um, occurs in densities high enough to synchronize. Um, and I'm kind of reluctant to advertise them because uh, like many of these phenomena, if, if they're not managed carefully, they can go away. But anyhow, that's the species in the mountains. And it typically, um, at, the la at the elevation of Smokemon, it typically kind of peaks around Memorial Day give or take a couple weeks. Um, and it peaks for about two weeks. And that happens because this firefly has about a one year life cycle. And the adult part of its life cycle is actually the shortest part mm -hmm. of its life cycle. Um, well, I guess maybe the eggs might be shorter. But anyway, um, this, the shortest part of its m mobile <laughs> life cycle, let's put it that way. Um, and so they're active for two or three weeks to mate, to uh, allow the females to lay eggs, to start the cycle over again. Um, the species that occurs in the lowlands is called Photurus frontalis, which actually that species lives in my backyard and I see them every spring. And it similarly has a life cycle that lasts about a year with an adult stage that lasts a couple weeks. Most fireflies 
Um, not all for sure. There are some really weird exceptions. Most fireflies as adults don't eat much, if anything. Their main job in the world is to find a mate mm -hmm. and make sure the species continues. And so that's why they don't live all that long and why that phenomenon is fairly uh, brief. There are a couple other species that have much longer flight periods and species that people might be a lot more familiar with in their own yards. Well, we have a lot of students watching today and will and we'll watch this in their classrooms. What is something they could do to help with the work of your research and other researchers? So, um, one thing that anybody can do um, is uh, they can try and uh, um, learn about fireflies to begin with and then they can help help us learn about the fireflies in North Carolina, for instance, by looking for the fireflies that occur in their yard. And if they can, um, you know, tell us what kinds they're finding or the flash patterns that they're observing, um, then that'll improve our knowledge of the distribution of fireflies. I live in Johnston County and I work in Wake County. Um, so I don't have a lot of opportunity to see what kind of fireflies are living in uh, Cleveland County or in Pasquotank County and so you know if you have students that are living in those areas that want to take the time to try and learn about fireflies and to recognize real importantly recognize their their flash patterns which is not hard it's it's basically like learning bird calls but with your eyes um, then they can help us learn in, in increase our knowledge of the distribution of the fireflies in North Carolina. And fireflies uh, are, I mean, they're really cool because they make light, but they're also ecologically important because they're predators in the ecosystems that they live in, and some fireflies are prey for other things. And they also can be very important um, bellwethers, very important canaries in the coal mine. Um, for telling us about the health of, of different ecosystems because some of them have very specific ecological um, requirements and they're very susceptible to disruption. And so if anybody can help us learn more about the distribution of the different species of fireflies in North Carolina, that's increasing our, our knowledge and that's increasing our ability maybe to help protect and manage these really cool critters. Well, we'll run some information along the bottom of the screen of where they can share those. Um, I want to thank you so much for inviting us to your dock Glad to, to do sit it. out in nature and learn more about these creepy crawlers that sometimes make us nervous, but we have to understand they're part of the circle of life and they're very important to us um, and especially beautiful at times. I'd say almost all insects are beautiful. Uh, if you study anything, any living uh, being on this planet long enough, you're going to find something spectacular. Uh, and with a million different kinds of insects out there, the opportunities for those kinds of discoveries are just all over. Wow. Yeah. Thank you so much. You bet. Thank you kids for joining us today for Sustainable Connections. We're excited to learn more about these creepy crawlers and what you can do to protect them and also to inspect them so that you can share your knowledge with Dr. Sorensen and other entomologists. Until next time.